DiscerningHearts.com. In cooperation with the Missionary Benedictines of Christ the King Priory presents The Holy Rule of St. Benedict, a spiritual path for today's world with Father Mauritius Fildi. Father Mauritius did his philosophical, theological, and doctoral studies in Europe. He is the author of numerous books, including I Want to Understand You, Encountering Foreign Worlds with a Little Prince, The New Image of God's Image, Meister Eckhart on Image and Theology, Peter and Paul, Models of Decision Making, and On the Way, Benedict's Journey for Spiritual Maturity. Father Mauritius serves as the prior of St. Anselm's in Rome. The Holy Rule of St. Benedict, a spiritual path for today's world, with Father Mauritius Fildi. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome, Father Mauritius. Thank you for having me. In looking at the Holy Rule, it doesn't surprise me that our next subject would be one that seems to have its this topic, its heart right there in the rule, and it's in place of wanting the latest sustainability. That seems to be a hallmark, isn't it, of the rule? That is true, of the rule and of the way of life of monks and Benedictines. Maybe in order to introduce you into this topic, I read from chapter 31 of the rule, which is on the qualifications of the monastery cellara. As cellara of the monastery, there should be chosen from the community someone who is wise, mature in conduct, temperate, not an excessive eater, not proud, excitable, offensive, dilatory or wasteful, but God-fearing and like a father to the whole community. He will take care of everything, but will do nothing without an order from the abbot. Let him keep his orders. Let him keep watch over his own soul, ever mindful of that saying of the apostle, he who serves well secures a good standing for himself. He must show every care and concern for the sick, children, guests and the poor, knowing for certain that he will be held accountable for all of them on the day of judgment. He will regard all utensils and goods of the monastery as sacred vessels of the altar, aware that nothing is to be neglected. He should not be prone to greed, nor be wasteful or extravagant with the goods of the monastery, but should do everything with moderation and according to the abbot's orders. I quoted this passage because twice the word wasteful appears. The seller shouldn't be wasteful. So here you get a glimpse already what St. Benedict means or what he sees as a sustainable way of leading a monastery or of uh, leading a monastic life. Practically, the monks mostly buy things that are sustainable, that are enduring, that are lasting. So when they have the choice to um, maybe buy or make a chair that is solid, that is firm, that will probably endure for, I don't know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, they would always choose the one that is sustaining and not the one that you can waste away, uh, that you can throw away uh, next year. So this is kind of a basic attitude that the monks look for things that last. And this has something to do with our vow of stability because we want to stay and so should the things that surround us be sustainable. So in this sense, we don't try to want the latest, because if you want to have the latest, you have to to throw away all things that are not new anymore, but rather have those things that are solid enough, good quality, 
and uh, will serve us also in a couple of years or maybe even, I don't know, decades or centuries. The term sustainability is a little bit awkward word, but um, this term comes originally from the forestry. It was created in order to find a good way how, how many trees should be cut and how many should be left alone. The idea is to cut only so many trees that in the whole the forest is still healthy. So cut only so many as other trees can grow. And as you know, it takes a long time for trees to grow. Mm -hmm. If you cut too many at the same time, you will, over time, kill the whole forest. You know, it cannot persist. So only what is renewable or can be grow again, this teaches you how much you can use or how much you can s spend. So this is the idea of sustainability. It's difficult speaking to a culture whose economy would desire you to seek the latest and the greatest by its marketing definition. Whether, the great, whether it's truly something that will last time, it, there's an enticement to say, well, it only costs this much. So you end up mm -hmm. for the lower price in the long haul, you'll have to buy, an, say, another chair mm -hmm. or another couch down mm -hmm. the, uh, in a shorter amount of time mm -hmm. to keep that economy going. Mm -hmm. But then resources are used and mm -hmm. things are consumed. Mm -hmm. And then it goes back to that adage, do you really need it? Mm -hmm. You are so right. Our whole system is set up like this to be good consumers, to buy things, and that also includes to throw things away because you cannot store everything. The reason why Benedict wants us to live in this sustainable way is there are different reasons for this, different motives. One reason is that we don't cling so much to things. You know, When you always want to have the latest, you have to follow all the time the advertisements, uh, the promotions in order to be up to date. That takes a lot of energy which is directed to products, to things. Mm -hmm. This energy we could spend for prayer and for community life and for our spiritual life. So this is one reason that we take things too serious if we always want to have new ones, new ones, and the latest. Another reason is that, as you mentioned it, what do we do to coming generations? Think about our dead, the dead of our uh, country. What do we leave the, the, other, the coming generations? And this is a question that is very strong in a monastery. We, we kind of plan and build and organize our things in order to enable a future in order not to take away the resources our descendants need and will need. Again, stability. That's the vow of stability. How can a monastery persist if we spend the resources and give them away? This would be the end of the monastery. It would be only thinking about ourselves and our times. No, we want to stay. So to save our resources, not to cut more trees than necessary. This is the idea behind. So by doing this, we respect the future. We respect the coming generations. We don't take ourselves too important, but instead think about what the coming generations need.
We'll return in just a moment to The Holy Rule of St. Benedict, a spiritual guide for today's world with Father Mauritius Fildi. Hi, this is Chris McGregor of Discerning Hearts, which is a 501c3 fully tax-deductible nonprofit organization dedicated to evangelization and spiritual formation through the use of new media. Discerning Hearts creates engaging multimedia specializing in podcasts and radio broadcasts, faithful to the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church and its rich, authentic spiritual tradition. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, please consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible to support our efforts. We charge nothing for any of the programs that are available on Discerning Hearts, and our outreach is literally to the world. Please tell a friend about Discerning Hearts and either download our free apps, which are available at iTunes and Google Play stores, or visit discerninghearts.com. Glorious St. Benedict, sublime model of virtue, pure vessel of God's grace, behold me humbly kneeling at your feet. I implore you in your loving kindness to pray for me before the throne of God. To you I have recourse in the dangers that daily surround me. Shield me against my selfishness and my indifference to God and to my neighbor. Inspire me to imitate you in all things. May your blessing be with me always, so that I may see and serve Christ in others and work for his kingdom. Graciously obtain for me from God those favors and graces which I need so much in the trials, miseries, and afflictions of life. Your heart was always full of love, compassion, and mercy toward those who were afflicted or troubled in any way. You never dismissed without consolation and assistance anyone who had recourse to you. I therefore invoke your powerful intercession, confident in the hope that you will hear my prayers and obtain for me the special grace and favor I earnestly implore. Help me, great Saint Benedict, to live and die as a faithful child of God, to run in the sweetness of His loving will, and to attain the eternal happiness of heaven. Amen. We now return to The Holy Rule of St. Benedict, a spiritual guide for today's world with Father Mauritius Fildi. That really, it does drive so many different aspects of our lives when we're always in that quest for the latest thing. And I don't mean to keep bashing on the the consumer side of it, Mm -hmm. but it does drive how much we will need to work to attain the latest, and then that affects our ability to be able to have that balance where, I, as you said, we need to be able to pray, we need to be able to sleep. It needs what our interaction will be like with the others around us because what's driving us is to acquire the latest mm-hmm. and not take the time to rest with what we have. Right. And again, to which do you bind your energy and your love and your heart? And this wonderful sentence in the chapter I just read, 31, when St. Benedict says, the seller should see all things of the monastery, all goods of the monastery as sacred vessels of the altar. It's an interesting point. First of all, how do you make a chalice? You try to make it sustainable because it kind of mirrors the eternity. In the same way as God never fades away and never ceases, we want to see it here on earth in a way. So sacred vessels, things for the altar, the liturgy, are made out of very precious material, very carefully, pieces of art, and you would treat them with respect. You wouldn't waste them. You wouldn't like to waste them. 
And Benedict says we should. All goods of the monastery regard like sacred vessels. That is, that is really interesting. So even the broom, the, the television set, um, the utensils in the kitchen, treated respectful because people have worked for it, somebody has paid for it, resources have been used for it. This is the point. To respect the created things. And when you do this, you are not as wasteful anymore with the things around you. Yeah, I think something that came leaping out when you were describing that is that, and in the very, very end of it, you have been blessed with it. And I'm just re recalling times where I've been working in missionary work in Latin America mm -hmm. where not having any utensils. Mm -hmm. What a blessing it is to have the service of fork, spoons, knives that we do have. Mm -hmm. They're not just utensils, but look at mm -hmm. the blessing of that. Mm -hmm. Or even the fact that you would have paper in the commode to be mm -hmm. able to use that we take we even take that for granted. We don't see the blessing mm -hmm. in what we've been given. Yeah. So to want more yeah. would it that feeds a a part of us that is not maybe so healthy. Yeah. And also when you keep utensils or things for a longer period of time, you kind of develop a kind of relationship to these things, maybe a jacket or maybe your desk or whatever it is. And that is not the worst thing to do. Um, let me take another example. Um, we had a confrere in our abbey who was a mechanic. And what he did was he purchased three accident-damaged cars and took out all things that were still usable and constructed or built a new car out of those things. That was a process that took a while, <laughs> but we only had those cars. It was all Volkswagen, so was good parts of uh, of those cars but it was a very creative procedure so wh what i what i really pity today is that when we only buy things and waste them and buy and waste we are so dependent from these companies who offer the things the companies have, have already designed it that after a couple of years they uh, they break mm -hmm. these these things in the past, it was more that you would repair things. This is what our brother did, you know, and you would try. This is an active thing. This is a creative thing to, to keep the things uh, going. This involves your activity, and this is a human value. If you instead just consume and just buy and waste, it's so passive, it's so boring. Excuse me, it's so boring. What can I do when the new iPhone comes out? Okay, this is what they offer. Okay, I buy it. You have only the choice. You buy it or you you skip and go to the next generation then. This is the only choice you have. You have mm -hmm. no other choice. You cannot, you cannot do so much with it. And so this Benedict loves an active handling of the things that we really use the thing, things and that involves a kind of relationship to handle them or to see them like sacred vessels maybe i should mention a uh, kind of uh, a balancing thought a thought that goes in another direction otherwise it, it i think it's uh, also not right when he says uh, the seller should not be dilatory or wasteful Dilatory, I think, means something like he should not procrastinate, he should not be hesitant or wasteful. This is wonderful. This is original Benedict when he says, so both is not good, being wasteful, but on the other hand, don't hesitate to buy new things. 
you know, mm -hmm. don't procrastinate. If, if something new is needed, try to get it. So here he's not, not hesitant to, to have new things. Yeah, it is interesting that he would use that particular contrast. It, it all goes back to that taking the pause to discern and essentially, do you really need it? Mm -hmm. And it, it repeatedly ask that question, not just one, because the emotions can move you, mm -hmm. the, that initial fervor. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. there, there's nothing wrong with taking that pause, is there? Mm -hmm. Right. This way of living more sustainable and working more sustainable includes the reduction of the speed of our life. This is slowing down our life. So maybe you have found this already in Benedictine or monastic communities. The life is sometimes a little bit slower. The pace is a little bit slower than in, in the other parts of the society. And this has something to do with it because when you, when you think, when you also regard the future, what is coming, when you think kind of in long terms, then things become slower. You don't have to, to go after the latest fashion. It's, it's not necessary because other fashions are coming again and again and again and again and again. Ah, you know, we know this, so, so why, why, why should we? And this sometimes slows us down, and I think that is not the worst thing to do nowadays. But these long-term thinking, this is typical Benedictine. Think about my community. The community I'm allowed to live in is 1,200 years old. It was founded in 816. You know, what is the latest fashion? What is that? You know, compared to this, to this time. And so you kind of become a little bit relaxed and say, okay, let's see. That does not mean that we are not open for, for new things. And sometimes in the history, the monks really have been up to date, even at the forefront of developments. Think about the science. In many, many things, the monks were the ones who brought the newest, uh, the latest but maybe they were able to do this because they were not too attached to these crazy <laughs> um, run for the latest. What do you suppose, Father Mauritius, is the thing that drives us to desire inordinately the latest? That's a wonderful question. Let me try to give two answers. One is we try to avoid something, avoid boredness, avoid being confronted with ourselves, avoid to pause, avoid to slow down. This would be a negative answer. The positive answer could be in order to Look something to to see something good in this tendency. God is new as well. God is always new, and so there is this longing for being young, having the latest, because we kind of sense that God is always young in a way. But on the other hand, he's always old too. <laughs> he's both. Ever ancient, ever new. Right. <laughs> mm. By the way, just as a side remark, according to the statistics, the monks live longer than all other persons in average. So the, the male monk lives four years longer than the average person in the society. It's very interesting. It is. Yeah. Very sustainable. That's very sustainable. <laughs> Well, any final thoughts on this particular topic, Father Mauritius? Yes. There was a cellarer in our monastery 
He was a settler for 38 years, imagine. He was a very good one, Father Anselm Grün. He was a good, or he's a good writer, spiritual author too. And he once said to me, if you want to be successful, think in long terms and persist. You've been listening to The Holy Rule of St. Benedict a spiritual path for today's world with Father Mauritius Fildi. To hear and or to download this program, along with hundreds of other spiritual programs, visit DiscerningHearts.com. This has been a production of DiscerningHearts.com. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to support our efforts. But most of all, we ask that you tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for The Holy Rule of St. Benedict, A Spiritual Path for Today's World with Father Mauritius Vildi.